thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting my channel. Get Nebula for free if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link in the description. It's the instruction manual that tells our bodies how to grow, function, and reproduce, all with only four base pairs. In fact, if you want to think about DNA in terms of computer data storage, each of our cells holds about 1.5 gigabytes of information. We have approximately 30 to 40 trillion cells in our bodies, so that's 45 to 60 trillion gigabytes of information in the 200 grams of DNA that each of us has. Seems like an efficient data storage method, right? But what if we wanted to store other information in DNA? After all, one of the things that can make machine learning datasets difficult for the average person to play with is the fact that they can be anywhere from hundreds of gigabytes to hundreds of terabytes in size. Well, it turns out we're not the first people to think about this. In fact, the idea was first proposed in the 1960s, and researchers have been working on creating synthetic DNA that can hold digital data, to the point where we've been able to store all 16 gigabytes of Wikipedia in synthetic DNA. So why don't we have DNA thumb drives now? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. If you're new here, I'm Jordan, and I'm a PhD student who's fascinated by the ways that we interact with algorithms and artificial intelligence in our daily lives. Consider subscribing to keep learning with me, and tell me what you'd store in synthetic DNA in the comments. So for any of you who might not have a background in biology, here's how DNA works. DNA is a molecule with a double helix structure that you're probably familiar with. The two strands that make up the helix are comprised of nucleotides, and each nucleotide contains a phosphate group, a sugar called deoxyribose, and one of four base pairs – cytosine, guanine, thionine, or adenine. The bases are paired, allowing the two strands to stay together. With these four base pairs, DNA stores all of our biological information, which can be replicated and transcribed to create things like proteins via transcription and translation. Interestingly, a large portion of our DNA seems to have no biological function at all. As we discussed earlier, DNA can theoretically hold a lot of information. For comparison, my laptop's hard drive can hold up to 512 gigabytes, so the DNA in my body could theoretically hold up to 90 billion times more data. But turning digital data into DNA is no small feat. In fact, researchers recently outlined one method for doing it in a 2020 Nature Protocols paper. They began by taking the binary code for their data and breaking it down into smaller pieces that could be mapped to strands. Redundancy was then added to the code, which we'll discuss a little bit later, to minimize the error when we try to convert our DNA back into digital data. Then the data was encoded by matching each of the four base pairs to two bits, as you can see here, creating our DNA sequences. And these sequences are then fed to a DNA synthesizer, which creates the actual strands. In the process, this results in us creating multiple strands of DNA for each sequence, which will be useful for us later on. To read our digital data back from our DNA, we randomly select individual strands to sequence and then sequence enough individual strands that we're relatively sure we've gotten all of our data back. The ratio of the number of individual strands of DNA that we sequence to the number of unique DNA strands is called coverage, and a good number to be at is usually between 20 and 200. Once we have our sequences, we can use the redundancy information that we put in earlier to figure out which are our unique strands and what order they go in, although we can expect some amount of error due to the sequencing and synthesis process. And from there, we recover our data. Okay, so if it's that easy, then why aren't we already doing it? Well, one, it's not that easy, and two, there are some challenges with this process. First, for a given position in a DNA strand, when that strand is synthesized and sequenced back, there's about a 1% chance that we will see an error in that position. This can be anything from the wrong base pair, which is called a substitution error, to no base pair at all, which is called a deletion error. Second, once you've synthesized your DNA, you need to know how to figure out which strand is associated with which part of your data. Scientists are currently trying to solve both of these challenges. Much of the work focusing on reducing that error is focused on introducing redundancy. Physical redundancy focuses on making sure that there are multiple copies of any one sequence so that you can average out the errors at the end. In fact, DNA synthesis naturally results in physical redundancy, but this isn't enough to substantially reduce our error rate. The other approach is logical redundancy, which focuses on adding additional information when you encode your data. This can be something like a label or a code that summarizes the data and where it should be in your larger dataset. To then find the strand that contains the information that you'd like to retrieve after it's been encoded into DNA, 
Researchers have found ways to uniquely identify strands so that you can re-identify them afterwards. One approach focuses on using fluorescent markers, and another approach focuses on using nanopore technology, where you can record the unique electrical signal of each strand of DNA as it passes through a small pore. Unfortunately, both of these approaches, as well as some of the others, come with some drawbacks. Nanopore technology has non-trivial error rates in identifying the electrical signal, and expanding the use of fluorescent markers requires better optical technology. There are also additional barriers to digital DNA storage as a consumer product. Current DNA synthesis technology is much cheaper and faster than it used to be, but it would still be about six orders of magnitude slower at reading and writing data, and seven orders of magnitude more expensive than our current options. DNA can also degrade rather quickly depending on the conditions that it's exposed to, in particular high temperatures and high humidity. Finally, you might be wondering whether DNA digital storage means that we'll be able to store data in living things. And the answer is... Yes, in very specific conditions. Research in this area has primarily focused on permanently storing DNA data in cells, either using enzymes called recombinases or using the CRISPR-Cas system, which you may have heard of. And researchers have been able to store small amounts of information this way, anything from a few bits to a few kilobytes so far. And perhaps one day far in the future, we'll be able to move towards storing data in people. But for now, we'll stick to doing digital DNA storage in the lab. In fact, I would love to do a video on how data is translated to DNA with the researchers who do it. Many of the labs that I mentioned in this video are located here in Boston. However, videos like that can be hard to make for YouTube. Getting access to the lab spaces as media as well as hiring people to do the actual filming can be time consuming and expensive for a small channel like me. That's why my creator friends and I teamed up to create Nebula, a platform where you can watch my videos ad free and we can experiment with awesome content without having to worry about demonetization or paying tribute to the YouTube algorithm. We're thrilled to be partnering with CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service with thousands of documentaries and nonfiction videos. Want to learn more about the future of storing information? Check out The End of Memory a documentary about the future of memory storage. Where Curiosity Streams all about big budget nonfiction documentaries, we're building Nebula because we want a place for education and creators to try out ideas that might not work on YouTube. You'll see some of your favorite creators on Nebula, from Braincraft to Up and Atom to MetaLife Crisis, as well as some original content that isn't on YouTube, like Tom Scott's game show Money, a series that takes some of your favorite creators and pits them against each other in psychological experiments where if they work together, they can win some money, but if they work alone, they can win more. CuriosityStream loves independent creators and wants to help us grow our platform, so if you click on the link in the description or use my promo code Jordan, you can get access to CuriosityStream for 26% off their annual plans, with Nebula included for free for as long as you are a CuriosityStream member. That's less than $15 a year. Clicking on that link really helps out my channel, so if you would like to support me while getting to watch my videos ad-free, sign up for CuriosityStream and Nebula using the link in the description or the promo code Jordan. If you want to learn more about the intersections of biology and AI, you can check out this video that I did on an AI-generated flu vaccine. And if you want to let me know that you enjoyed this video, you can do so by smashing that like button and subscribing to my channel. If you have topic requests, want to ask me questions, or just want to see what my PhD life is like, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and otherwise, I will see you guys next Friday. Bye!